Health South may not be a name that everyone knows, but they were responsible for one of the largest accounting scandals of all time. It is an incredible story about what was once one of the most successful, fastest growing businesses out there. Within the span of 14 years, they grew from nothing into a Fortune 500 company. They were on that list every year from 1998 to 2003. Then in 2003, it came out that it was pretty much all a big lie. Health South was intentionally messing with their financial statements to make themselves look better than they actually were, essentially lying to the public and scamming anyone who had invested in their stock or had any stake in the company. It was inexcusable. I honestly get a little upset when talking about crimes like this, but I think that it's important to do so. So here is my simple overview of the infamous Health South accounting scandal. The person at the center of all this is Richard Scrooge, who I have to admit does have some inspirational elements to his story. In the early 1970s, he he was actually a married teenage father who dropped out of high school and was struggling to make money. But it was that struggle that motivated him to return to school where he was able to obtain a degree in respiratory therapy and by the early 1980s had worked his way up to a vice presidency position at a healthcare management firm called LifeMark. Now, being deeply involved in the financial end of the medical industry, he was well aware of everything that was happening and identified a strong demand for these outpatient rehabilitation centers. I'm not talking about the ones for drugs, but more along the lines of physical rehabilitation. These centers were already starting to become more common because they offered a cheaper alternative to the traditional medical process. Hospitals have a high overhead, and you may have experienced that if you get anywhere near them, it gets expensive. So in many cases, a much simpler rehab center would prove to be just as effective at a lower cost. They can help you avoid surgeries, get back to work quicker, and that's just good for everybody. In 1984, Richard Scrooge quit his job at LifeMark to start a business centered around this concept. He even convinced four of his co-workers to join him. It was originally called Amcare, but the name was quickly changed to HealthSouth. It was a smart idea to start a business in a promising industry like this, but he was also good at making it stand out from the others. His facilities visually did not resemble hospitals, and no one wants to feel like they're in a hospital, so he intentionally strayed away from it. Instead, they had more of an open area health club type feel to them, which created a happy happier mood and made people more willing to go. On top of that, the large population of baby boomers were starting to grow older and experiencing more joint injuries. So when you combine the attractive twist on a growing concept with a growing demographic, it proved to be a successful business. All of this was enough to convince a venture capitalist to invest about a million dollars in the concept early on, and from that point, they were up and running. They quickly started opening new locations, became a public company after two years of business, and eventually became a respected name in the world of sports medicine, famously treating big name athletes like Michael Jordan and Dan Marino. By the end of the 1980s, they had dozens of facilities, both inpatient and outpatient, and were generating over a hundred million dollars in revenue each year, which I think we all can agree is a pretty impressive six years for Health South. But here's the thing, that was just the beginning. Things get absolutely ridiculous from this point, because in the 1990s is when they exploded. They started the decade with around $100 million in sales and ended it with an unbelievable $4 billion. That is about 40 times higher and let me tell you how it happened. I feel like I'm always talking about various acquisitions on this channel, but hardly ever to this extent. I like this headline from 1995 saying, Acquisitive Health South hopes bigger will be better. Here's a list of some of the more notable ones over that time, just one after the other spending hundreds of millions of dollars on each one. They were generally either a direct competitor or involved in a similar industry. That one there, in 1995, Surgical Health Corporation marked their first involvement in outpatient surgery centers, which is another market that they quickly started to control. By the end of the decade, they were by far the biggest of their kind, with over 2,000 facilities located in every state across the country. I mean, this was a massive success story, one that sounds almost 
too good to be true. Starting in 1996, right in the middle of their quest to take over the industry, Health South found themselves in financial trouble. The reasons behind the trouble can be debated. I would argue that this expansion was not helping things. You can say that it was too expensive or too distracting, maybe there were less than ideal targets. It's also hard to deny the effects of the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. It was a plan put in place by the federal government where they would save over a hundred billion dollars in Medicare costs over the next five years. Considering Medicare was Health South's largest source of revenue, making up 37% of it, that would prove to have a major impact on them. Whatever the reason, the fact is that over this time, Health South was not earning nearly as much money as everyone was expecting them to. So instead of admitting it to the public and coming forward with the bad news like they should have, they chose to lie about it. Their analysts would figure out specifically what kind of numbers they needed to report to appear successful, and then the accountants were told to illegally move some of the figures around until those were the numbers on their reports. They used all of the classic accounting tricks, notably overestimating insurance premiums, which made their revenue appear higher, and capitalizing expenses, which made their expenses appear lower. It actually looks like that one may have been happening to some extent well before 1996. That's when you classify something as an asset rather than an expense, and according to Health South co-founder and longtime chief financial officer Aaron Beam, from the beginning, we were putting things on the balance sheet that probably should have stayed on the profit and loss statement. You probably already know that once you falsely raise your revenue and lower your expenses like this, you end up with an outrageously overstated earnings figure. In 2003, a different former CFO, Weston Smith, came forward about the whole thing, which prompted an investigation by the SEC. They initially found that Health South had been lying on the reports going back to 1999 with misstatements totaling $1.4 billion, which was later believed to be almost double that. These are major misstatements. Like in 1999, they told the public that they made $230 million when in fact they lost $191 million. I think we can agree that these statements did not reflect the state of the company, and I'm going to tell you why that matters so much. And it mostly comes down to their stock price. Say, if I were a potential investor back then, and I see that they made $230 million last year, I might be motivated to buy that stock. But if I had instead seen that they had lost $191 million, it might be smarter to stay away. If earnings are high, more people are going to want to buy it and the price goes up. They wanted that stock price to be high for a few reasons. For one, the acquisitions, many of them were bought in part with that stock. If the price is high, it can be used to buy stuff, and then it's a cycle because the price continues to rise because they're expanding. The second big reason is for personal gain. Many of the executives who ordered the fraud to happen owned a bunch of Health South stock and wanted to see the prices go up. Like possibly Richard Scrooge, the founder and CEO, personally made about a hundred million dollars from the sale of it. To put it simple, Health South couldn't live up to these high Wall Street expectations and for reasons both personal and professional, that motivated the executives within the company to make these fraudulent figures. The man that many people believe is behind all of it is Richard Scrooge. I mean, he was the founder, the CEO, and the overall face of the company. If they were misstating their earnings by literally billions of dollars, you would expect he would be involved, or at the very least know it was happening. Well, after an extensive six-month trial, during which multiple executives within the company, including five former CFOs testified against him, he was found to be not guilty. Now, I should mention that he was found guilty in a separate trial soon after, where the charges included bribing a governor, he served six years in prison, but as far as this whole fraud that I've been talking about, he was found to be completely innocent. As I've said, this scandal came to light in 2003, while most of the bigger accounting scandals, including Enron, happened a year or two earlier. The legal response to all of those was Sarbanes-Oxley, which is an act that anyone who has studied or been involved in accounting is now familiar with. It was practically custom designed to prevent this exact sort of thing from happening. See, with the Enron case, a big issue was their CEO, Jeff Skilling, denied that he knew anything illegal was happening. He practically said that he knew nothing about accounting and that whole department was doing stuff without him knowing. Which is silly, but Sarbanes-Oxley addressed that. A big part of it said that the CEO now had to attach his name and certify that the financial statements fairly represented the company. I think that the hope there was that they can no longer claim ignorance because 
because they now had to sign off on those statements. Well, this health out scandal was the first time Sarbanes-Oxley was tried in court, and, well, it didn't work very well because Richard Scrooge was able to use a very similar defense. I signed off on, uh on the information based on what was provided to me and what I was told. Another aspect to consider is the auditors. In this case, it was the accounting firm Ernst & Young. The job of an auditor is to look over these statements and confirm, within reason, that they fairly represent this company. But the thing here is that many of the people working at HealthSouth committing the fraud were former employees of Ernst & Young. They knew exactly what they would be checking and exactly how to navigate around it. Now, of course, they should have detected billions of dollars worth of fraud, so at the very best, they were negligent. In 2009, they paid a $109 million settlement with the Health South shareholders. So there we have it. That's a simple overview of one of the largest accounting frauds of all time. It almost brought Health South into bankruptcy, but they were able to avoid it. They've gone through some major changes and go by a different name now, but they do still exist today. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of this scandal? I'm just amazed by how far they were able to take it. $2.7 billion in earnings were misstated and they were somehow able to keep it under wraps. The big questions here are whether or not Ernst & Young or Richard Scrooge knew about it. Just looking at the facts, it seems like they must have, right? On the positive end, at least we can use this as an example and hopefully learn from the mistakes of the past and prevent things like this from happening in the future. So any thoughts you have about the infamous Health South fraud, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.